Good afternoon, friends. My name is Cameron Patterson, Executive Director here at the Robert Russell Moton Museum, and I'm excited to welcome you to our March Moton Mondays program. I'm very excited for this program today because we had the opportunity to share with you some information about an exciting initiative that the Moton Museum has been engaged with uh, for a couple of years now. Um, and it's really exciting that this initiative and the work being done continues to gain steam. Um, and we're excited um, as we continue to move forward. Uh, our Moton Mondays program um, is an opportunity for us to engage with different historical topics, as well as to update you regarding initiatives that we are working on here at the Moton Museum. And so for today's program, we are excited to share with you about the World Heritage Initiative uh, that is being sponsored by the team from Georgia State University. And so with this initiative, I'm excited to welcome uh, two great colleagues, uh, Ann Ferris and uh, Dr. Glenn Eskew, who directs the project. Uh, so we're going to have a presentation today from both of them. We'll have an opportunity to end our time with a Q&A period. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box below and we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, we've got an exciting week here at Moton. Uh, we have our CG Gordon Moss lecture on Thursday, March the 18th at 7 p.m. via our Moton YouTube and Facebook platforms. We are excited to welcome Dr. Dewana Waugh, the Assistant Professor of History at Sweetbriar College. Uh, we are planning full steam ahead for our Moton Live event on April the 23rd of this year. Um, if you are interested in an inside look at that Moton Live effort, we encourage you to join us this Wednesday at 12 noon as Kanan Townsend shares the impact that Moton is having with our K-12 audience across the Commonwealth. So again, welcome to Moton Live, and I am excited to turn the program over first to Dr. Glenn Eskew. Well, good afternoon, uh, and thank you, Patterson, for the invitation to speak with Moton Mondays uh, regarding the Georgia State University World Heritage Initiative and our effort to create a serial nomination of U.S. civil rights movement sites for the National Park Service Office of International Affairs to propose for inscription on the World Heritage List. As the director of the Georgia State University World Heritage Initiative, I had a team of scholars and historic preservationists developing the serial nomination. At Georgia State University, we have a number of civil rights movement experts on our faculty and one of the nation's leading programs in historic preservation. With me delivering today's presentation is the project manager, Ms. Ann Ferrisi. In addition, with a regular contact with Stephen Morris of the National Park Service, we've been working closely with more than 75 scholars of the civil rights movement state historic preservation officers, city planners and architects, as well as owners and stakeholders of these historic properties, such as the good people there at Moton High School uh, to advance uh, this, in, this nomination. Our efforts have been underwritten uh, by the state of Alabama, the National Park Service and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. A word about world heritage. Now, Antiquity had its seven wonders of the world, but today there's the World Heritage List that sets out to identify and protect the most important natural and cultural places around the globe for the benefit of all humanity. Securing inscription on the World Heritage List requires extensive argumentation, documentation, and legal protection. At the outset, important sites must express outstanding universal value, or OUV is determined by criteria set by the World Heritage Committee. In addition to global significance, the site must retain conditions of integrity and authenticity and demonstrate proper protection and management so that the site will be there forever. We'll be talking about those details. The building of the Aswan Dam in post-war Egypt and the subsequent flooding of major temple sites led to the United States proposing the World Heritage Convention in 1972 
and then becoming the first nation to sign this international treaty designed to protect the most significant cultural and natural places on earth. So far, 193 other countries, states, parties, they're called, have signed the convention. It's overseen by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO. The convention authorizes a World Heritage Committee of 21 members elected from the state parties to manage its activities and to determine what sites will be inscribed on the list. To date, there are 1,121 properties inscribed on the World Heritage List. These places of global significance are located in the territories of over 167 countries. Most are cultural sites that regard the evolution of human history. And of these 869 places, most are well known. There are 213 natural sites and a handful of sites, only 39 of them, that are inscribed as mixed with both cultural and natural attributes. Some state parties dominate the list, such as Italy, which has 55, and China, 55. Others have signed the treaty, and they've yet to get a single place inscribed on the list. To date, the United States has 24 properties inscribed on the list. The majority, 12 of them, are natural sites, such as Yellowstone, Yosemite, Olympic National Park. There are 11 cultural sites, and these include buildings designed by Thomas Jefferson, the, uh, the Pueblo in Taos, New Mexico, Independence Hall, and the recently inscribed sites associated with Frank Lloyd Wright. There's one mixed site, too, Papahanaumokuikwe Marine National Monument, with its relics of early Hawaiian civilization in the middle of the Pacific. Why so few in the U.S.? Well, politics. Unlike other countries, the United States does not have an agency in the federal government preparing World Heritage nominations. Instead, it authorizes the National Park Service to assist efforts by independent citizens who undertake this expensive work. In addition to domestic challenges of the international ones, because the United States treats UNESCO like a political football, withdrawing from the organization, pretending not to be part of the larger world, and then rejoining, cutting its dues, and then repaying them. It's now hoped that the new Biden administration will reverse the Trump administration's withdrawal and get the U.S. Congress to pay its back dues to the World Heritage Convention and rejoin UNESCO and once again become active in the world in good standing. Like our effort, others have been trying to secure inscription on the World Heritage List, and the process is lengthy. First step is getting on the tentative list, and that's an initial challenge left to the government to decide. For us, it'd be the Park Service. A few years back, Mount Vernon made the tentative list, but when it was proposed to the World Heritage Committee, there were problems with the nomination, and they opted not to inscribe it on the list. An effort focused on Charleston's rice-growing culture failed to make the tentative list altogether. And the 10 properties initially considered for Frank Lloyd Wright's nomination, when it uh, was on the tentative list, uh, ended up with only eight of them being inscribed by the World Heritage Committee. All three of these examples had problems with their Outstanding Universal Value, or OUV. Now, a site must explain the three pillars of world heritage by documenting why it is globally significant and showing how it retains conditions of integrity and authenticity, while also demonstrating proper protection and management so that it might be secure into the future. The OUV is the argument that makes the property exceptional from all others in the world and therefore worthy of inscription. Egypt's pyramids display human creative genius and cultural traditions of ancient empire. The Great Wall of China demonstrates interchange of values and advances in construction. The lagoons of Venice reveal a network of canals around ancient architecture that appears to float. Now you might be wondering how to compare civil rights movement sites with the pyramids. But rest assured, there are all kinds of OUV and ways of using the justification of criteria for inscription. And it takes determination. Advocates of Frank Lloyd Wright spent 30 years promoting the idea uh, for inscription. The city of San Antonio spent 12 years trying to get its Spanish missions inscribed. 
In addition to any private property owner's consent, which is required, a U.S. property being considered must have achieved the highest recognition possible in America, and that means it must be a National Historic Landmark, an NHL, or affiliated with the National Park Service as a national monument or a park. A number of places across the country have managed to do this, including the Brooklyn Bridge in New York and the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia, and these are all preparing their nomination dossiers too. As for this serial nomination of U.S. civil rights movement sites, it began as a response to the World Heritage Committee's call to countries to update their tentative lists and the National Park Service wanting to include places that fit a global strategy designed to diversify that World Heritage list. Consequently, the National Park Service embraced efforts uh, to uh, propose the Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church in Montgomery and the 16th Street and Bethel Baptist Churches in Birmingham as the three Alabama churches, placing it on the U.S. tentative list in 2008, but with an understanding that a more complete proposal of civil rights movement sites would be developed as a serial nomination. After that, the effort stalled until October 2016, when the state of Alabama contracted with Georgia State University to launch our World Heritage Initiative to develop this serial nomination of U.S. civil rights movement sites. To conceptualize a serial nomination, the GSU World Heritage Initiative organized a World Heritage and U.S. Civil Rights Sites Symposium held in April 2017 on the Georgia State University campus. In Atlanta, scholars of the African-American freedom struggle debated the scope of the nomination, uh, focusing on the fight to overturn de jure racial segregation and second-class citizenship in the areas targeted by the modern civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. To justify this periodization, the effort cited three uh, thematic studies written by the National Park Service and recommendations by scholars and state historic preservation officers. The GSU Initiative prepared a list initially of 125 historic places related to the uh, post-war civil rights movement. That has since expanded to over 300 places that all receive some level of local, state, or federal recognition or designation. This compilation served as a working list of potential sites for further evaluation for the serial nomination. Symposia attendees began discussing these properties, identifying which ones seemed most important and appropriate for a nomination, such as the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, the Central High School in Little Rock, and Moton High School in Farmville. Before adjourning this symposia, scholars began debate on a statement of outstanding universal value for movement sites. They recognized the potential serial nomination represented uh, the nonviolent struggle in the United States against racial segregation and for first-class citizenship of African Americans with equal access to the system being justified under World Heritage Criteria 2 and 6. Criterion 2 emphasizes an important interchange of human values over a span of time on developments in architecture, technology, monumental arts, town planning, and landscape design. The serial nomination argues that racial segregation was a spatial manifestation of the ideology of global white supremacy expressed as separate and unequal spaces in architecture, town planning, and landscape design that oppressed people of color challenged through nonviolent direct action confrontation designed to remove the racial distinctions and open up the built environment. Examples of anti-colonial passive resistance against racial prescriptions in India and Africa convinced black leaders of the value of nonviolent protest designed to physically transform society. By virtue of becoming racially desegregated, the physical assets of the nominated property relate to this interchange of ideas regarding nonviolent protest undertaken to force tangible change in the built environment while also gaining such intangible ideals as freedom, democracy, and equality. Previously, the racially segregated design reinforced legal white supremacy, but little evidence of that remains, while instead tangible evidence of transformed properties 
uh, manifested through desegregation, demonstrate the removal of structural impediments to space now open to all, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Also, the serial nomination uses criterion six to be directly or tangibly associated with events of outstanding universal significance. During the 1950s and 60s, African Americans staged a series of protests over racial discrimination in the public sphere through such events as the school desegregation lawsuits, bus boycotts, sit-ins at lunch counters and on buses, trains, planes, and massive street protests. The challenge to the color line led to such reforms as the Brown v. Board of Education decision of 1954, which resulted in desegregated schools, the Congressional Civil Rights Act of 1964, which opened public accommodations to all regardless of race, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which provided African Americans with equal access to the political system, and the 1968 Fair Housing Act that ended the legal segregation by race of neighborhoods. All civil rights sites find their origins in an environment of racial separation. Yet because of the protest at these particular sites, resulting in the toppling of legal white supremacy and drawing global attention, the historic landmarks of the civil rights nomination we're proposing rises above the rest becoming events of universal significance that ushered in an American ideology of racial equality and encouraged human rights struggles the world over. The U.S. civil rights movement sites demonstrate outstanding universal value by inspiring a global embrace of nonviolent protests designed to alter the built environment that removed structural impediments to freedom, democracy, and equality. What began as an interchange of ideas among anti-colonial activists from India, Asia, and Africa, and the United States became a global strategy to end divisions in society based on race, class, gender, and in time, sexual orientation and physical ability. Not only did desegregation transform the properties by ending racial divisions constructed into the buildings and landscapes themselves, but today, that transformation is venerated at the nominated sites as shrines to the power of nonviolent social change to achieve universal values. Similar sim, uh, serial nominations are being developed by other countries. The most relevant in our case is the South African Liberation Heritage Route, a serial nomination of 13 properties associated with the anti-apartheid movement that is modeled on the Australian convict site which includes 11 prisons and properties scattered around the continent down under. Another relevant serial nomination has been proposed by India that marks the sites of Satyagraha, India's nonviolent independence movement. It consists of 21, uh, 22 properties from around the subcontinent associated with Mahatma Gandhi and the sites of nonviolent clashes with the British Army over abusive colonial policies. There are also the Luther memorials in Germany that reflect heritage sites associated with liberation in the case of the Protestant Reformation, and also uh, sites uh, in a serial nomination being proposed in Poland uh, regarding freedom and democracy uh, concerning the properties of Gdansk that are associated with the solidarity movement of the 1989. Over the first two years of phase one of the project, Members of the GSU team undertook visits to nearly half of the 300 properties considered, including a stop by Moton High School in Farmville, Virginia. Soon a short list of possible places for a serial nomination emerged with research undertaken on these sites. Work began in 2017 uh, at the US Civil Rights Movement site Symposia, and that work has continued with the writing of drafts for an OUV and justification. During phase two, the GSU team uh, revisited leading properties under consideration and began work on management plans for them. The GSU team submitted a revised draft OUV and justification to the World Heritage Committee to uh, request an upstream evaluation, an assessment that would help us preparing the dossier. And we prepared for another symposium. Then COVID-19 hit and shut everything down. The GSU team at first postponed the planned 2020 U.S. Civil Rights Movement Sites Symposia for April 2021, 
but canceled it altogether, and likewise canceled a third round of site visits. Yet work continued throughout on preparing documents. Now, in phase three, over the next two years, the GSU team will complete preparation of the dossier of the serial nomination uh, for ultimate submission. This will require selected sites, which we hope will include Moton High School, to complete its management plan and put in place a local group of supporters who can advocate on behalf of World Heritage in Farmville. So there remains much to do. And with numerous bureaucratic agencies and advisory bodies involved in these advanced stages of the nomination process, who knows when inscription of these globally significant civil rights places might actually take place. But the GSU team is determined to see that happen and appreciates your support and your interest this afternoon. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Ann Farisee. Uh, but given uh, the nature of the way this uh, PowerPoint's working today, I'm going to be advancing the slides for her. So, Anne, you start, and I'll uh, try to keep up with you. Hello? Okay. I think I was on mute. There you uh, go. Need, need you to advance. Thank you. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and really appreciate you uh, watching this and learning more about what's going on with Moton Museum and Moton High School. Uh, Glenn has talked quite uh, well about basically how the program works and what our approach is, what we are trying to achieve with this nomination. And what I want to do is just kind of focus in on a few aspects of it and uh, talk a little bit about the role that Moton plays. So, of course, as he described, we are talking about a serial nomination. And really, the, the idea of a serial nomination is that the whole is, is bigger than the sum of its parts. So we have a series of sites, of which Moton is one of them. Each of them plays an important role. And together, they make up the civil rights movement um, a, a proposal. So in the case of Moton, we have many reasons to be including it, one being, of course, it was uh, one of the cases that is the origin of the Brown versus Board of Education case. It had the most plaintiffs of any of the other um, schools involved. And then also that we see here a dramatic beginning of the student leadership in the movement. So we had some of the youngest students involved in a very meaningful way, which then we saw uh, later on with the sit-ins and uh, freedom Riders and all the other things that students were doing during the movement. Bink. So about this idea about outstanding universal values. So one of the uh, concepts of it is authenticity and integrity. And in the case of Moton, it's whether or not the site that we're proposing is truthful and credibly expressed. So has it been researched? Are you, are you telling it as it happened as we know? Um, and with World Heritage, they're very particular about how they like to express authenticity. They use something called attributes, and it's a whole list of qualities that a site could have, and Moton has many of those qualities. It's original form, design, materials. Uh, the use may not be original, but it's still very much related as it's an educational facility. The, uh, the work itself that it was done often authentically, as in the case of the auditorium, which is so beautifully restored. Location is uh, original. And of course, the spirit of feeling when you go to visit Moton, you really have a sense of what it was like to go to school there. The other piece of it is integrity. And integrity can roughly be translated to condition, but it's about the wholeness and the intactness of the, uh, of the site. So whether or not everything is included in its boundaries, what condition it's in, and whether or not it is uh, suffering from any kind of neglect or uh, development pressure or anything like that. So in Moton's case, we're in very good shape. Now, the next piece of the outstanding universal value is the management plan. And that is a very general term for a lot of different things. But in the world heritage land, it means that you're effectively protecting the property now and in the future. 
And that includes uh, integrity and authenticity. Now, in the case of Moton, we're very fortunate that we have this outstanding partnership between the university and the museum. And that was uh, formalized and um, put into motion in a very um, per in perpetuity kind of way with the 2015 covenant that was formed between those two entities. And in that covenant, Longwood University pledged that they would um, assist and support the museum, that it would have local community, um, it would be run by the local community, and that they would give it as much support as it would need. So when you talk about this management plan, of course, I said it, it contains a lot of things. There are many components to a management plan. So whatever you think it might mean, it means even more. So that includes the conservation, the maintenance, repairs, uh, how you interpret the site, how you educate people, what kind of programming, visitation, who your partners are, all those things that together are involved in running a historic site like Moton, all of which are very well developed at Moton. The, one of the most important aspects, and frankly can be um, challenging, is the, is the protection aspect. So any property inscribed on World Heritage has to have good protection that will protect it in perpetuity. Well, so World Heritage is not just concerned with how are you the next 10 years or the next 50 years. They're thinking about the next 100 years. And when you protect the site, you do it at a, a couple of levels. The site itself, where you have very carefully drawn boundaries and the very strongest protection, and then an area around it called the buffer zone, where you um, where you augment that protection. So, talking about buffer zones, um, so this is the area around the nomin uh, around the property, around the school and its ball field and the land that it sits on, and it's an area around the property that has additional layer of protection of some sort. And the kind of protection World Heritage is looking for is that the historic context or the setting of Moton remains intact, that historic views of the building, because Moton was on the edge of town, it had a, a wide open land around it, and still it's very, uh, very visible, that those kind of things are protected. And in the case of Moton, its buffer zone um, has some interesting resources, such as the Mary Branch Elementary School um, or Community Center. That's a very important uh, link to Moton historically. You have the cemetery where a lot of uh, African-American uh, leaders in Farmville are interred. And then you have some historic resources like the funeral home, the realtor um, that are nearby it. All right, the final piece of the management plan, and it's a good one, is the coordinated management plan. Because this is a serial nomination and you have a bunch of sites that together are one listing, they need to be managed in a somewhat coordinated way. And this, the specifics of this have not yet been defined because we need to work with all of the sites together to define it. And we have just formed a sites advisory board that Cameron is serving on, thank goodness, um, that's going to in the future be talking about this. But there are some things I can, can tell you about what this coordinated plan would look like. It will probably be some kind of committee or council that gets together once a year, possibly ad hoc. And that every site, including Moton, will definitely be represented on the council. And then uh, some of the things that this group would do is that they're going to uh, collect data. You know, they're going to ask for reports and put them together for the National Park Service. A lot of it's going to be networking, sharing information, what's working, what's not working, how do you do this, how do we do that, and so that these um, sites have a resource in each other. The one thing I know it's not going to do, it's not going to regulate. There are not going to be additional restrictions or regulations that this council is going to be managing. Every site, be it a National Park Service, National Monument, or be it Moton Museum with its board, each site is managed independently. All right, so after uh, designation, so we go through this marvelous long process that Glenn has touched on. What do we do? Well, we celebrate. Um, you know, now we have this group of American civil rights sites, American civil rights sites 
that are recognized internationally. Moton is now part of a group that is considered to be of global significance. And each of these sites, including Moton, is, protect, is protected in perpetuity. So that means generations to come will have these sites to learn from. Now, there are a few ongoing requirements, as you could guess, because of that council that's going to be formed in meeting. And one of them is reporting. World Heritage does require a report every six years. Um, I've looked over kind of what it asks for. It's sort of the general stuff that you would expect. They want to know what's going on with each site, that they're being maintained, any changing circumstances, and just, just give information about the site. Probably the way it will work for our sites is that they'll do an annual report to this coordinated council that will come up with some form, keep it as simple as we can. And if they fill it out every year, then every six years, somebody can go in and look at them all and just come up with a six year report. Also World Heritage, of course, to keep things in good condition, they require monitoring. So as terms of the state party or the National Park Service, they are required every time there is an exceptional circumstance that occurs or a big development threat or something like that, they are to be told about that, notified about it, and then they're supposed to notify World Heritage because World Heritage wants to get involved early. They like to resolve these things with um, consultation. They put together um, committees that will come out and work with the local site. Um, so what they really want to do is sort of head it off at the pass. But in terms of what does this mean for Moton, really it kind of comes down to a checklist. Um, I'm, I've designed sort of a master checklist, which we'll be sending to the representatives uh, on our site's advisory board soon, that they can tailor it to their site. But it's basically, you know, your roof, your HVAC, you know, your systems, um, what's your visitation like, if you had any crowding issues, but it's all, it's pretty much a checklist of how many people did this or that, so that they, we have a way of uh, monitoring what's going on without it being onerous on the sites. One question we get all the time, of course, is what's this gonna mean for the community? What kind of economic impact would World Heritage non, uh, designation have? And the question is, yes, it will have an impact. How much of an impact it has really depends on what the community puts into it. Uh, World Heritage is a recognition of your sites, not only its importance, but its uniqueness and how authentic it is and how rich the sense of place or history is. And of course, it's global significance. So working from that, that's what World Heritage designation means. And that's what you can work with in terms of uh, marketing your community as well as the site. And so in the case of um, Farmville, I like to think this has an umbrella effect because you have a rich civil rights history. You have a civil rights tour. You have things beyond Moton that people can come and experience. And so what you obviously would be beneficial would be that when people come to see Moton that they stay and learn more about Farmville. The other um, aspect of how much of an impact it would have has a lot to do with where you're starting out from. In the case of this uh, graph that you see here, this is from San Antonio, the five missions around San Antonio. They have a ton of visitation. I think it, um, I think it was something like 200 million a year. And they looked and they had an economic impact study done that determined that, of course, the more they put in, the more um, impact it would have in terms of dollars and percentages. In their case, that curve you see, which is if you put in nothing, if you put in a modest effort or a lot of work, that curve is fairly flat because they're starting from such a big base. Farmville, I would expect it would look very different. Your base is smaller, you're a smaller attraction. So you don't have 200 million to start with, but with the efforts that you put in, you'll have a much higher percentage impact from World Heritage. And that would be, uh, could be much more in some case, in some scenarios, it could be much more transformative for Farmville. Okay, well, finally, the local community. 
So you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, well okay, this is all great. Well, wh what do they need or you know, how do we help make this happen? And we do need support from the local community. There are several points along this passage where World Heritage or the National Park Service or your state representatives, they're looking for so they're looking for support for this idea. They want to make sure this is something that Farm Bill wants to do. This isn't our choice. This is something that the community needs to want. And so there are points at which we will be turning to Moton and then perhaps turning to the community at large and asking for a letter of support or an email or something so that um, you know, when we go to get the tentative list expanded, when we go to get our official nomination begun, and when the designation is up before World Heritage, we will definitely look for, and we hope to get, support from you all in Farmville. Glenn, do you want to say anything else about that? Um, sure. I, I'll simply add that um, there's an opportunity, I think, that will be coming up later this spring uh, the United States uh, can conceivably rejoin the world by uh, paying its back dues uh, to the World Heritage Committee uh, and becoming an active player uh, in the uh, effort again, as well as perhaps even if uh, President uh, Joe Biden and the uh, Congress uh, is willing to go that far, uh, rejoining UNESCO and becoming an active member of our global community. That is desperately needed, and it will benefit uh, this World Heritage effort immensely. Uh, and so uh, later I'll be getting back in touch with uh, Mr. Patterson uh, and suggesting ways that uh, Moton Museum might reach out to a congressional delegation uh, and encourage it to support uh, President Biden's bid uh, to rejoin the World Heritage Committee. Uh, Mr. Patterson, should I stop sharing? Yep, I will pull that off so you are good. So uh, thank you so much for that presentation. And uh, we are looking forward to the opportunity to support um, and advocate for the United States uh, recommitting and reengaging in that relationship with UNESCO. Um, you know, I think what excites me or has excited me about this effort from the beginning is that a lot of the things that we're doing to get ready for this are just things that we should be doing um, as an institution. You know, the idea of putting together a management plan, you know, we're really bringing in components of things that we're already working on. Um, and I think, you know, we've kind of found that in the process. You know, we've already had visitation plans, you know, we're, we were already working on an emergency management update. Uh, so these are all critical things that are important to the management of a site um, that we're already working on. Um, and if we're not working on it, uh, we are certainly starting that process and will only be strengthened uh, through this initiative. Um, you know, Glenn, I'm interested uh, just kind of going back to that initial list of 300 sites. Uh, what were the conversations like to get that down to um, the handful of sites that you're targeting as a part of this uh, initiative? That's that's an excellent question, uh, Cameron, and uh, it's it's been arduous indeed uh, because that's uh, that really has uh, how do you determine what sites best express the story of the civil rights movement in America? Uh, and it's been a real challenge. We, we uh, wanted to do, be sure we did our due diligence and considered everything that we possibly could uh, that was um, a site associated with uh, the idea of the modern civil rights movement. And so uh, from the get-go then, it was a matter of how do we frame this idea of a serial nomination to represent the civil rights movement. Uh, and that then deferred to the scholars for them to say. Uh, and it was rather apparent uh, at the outset that we wanted to focus on the African-American freedom struggle, 
uh, that we uh, wanted to look at uh, the post-war effort that people think of as the civil rights movement uh, more specifically uh, and to identify places then that could conceivably uh, tell that story. Uh, but the ultimate uh, determination in some ways was, well, what aspect of the movement story? Because there's so many. Uh, how do you narrow it down? And the conclusion was, well, for this case, uh, the argument will be over the nonviolent struggle, uh, the role of uh, the uh, global ideology of the nonviolent protest to change the world. Uh, and consequently then, once we started narrowing uh, the period down and the focus down and then the issue down to nonviolence, a handful of sites clearly uh, demonstrated themselves. We have about a dozen, the Baker's dozen that we're recommending. One final point, uh, and, and that's that we're just pulling together materials for what could be a serial nomination that we're suggesting these places seem to work best. But the ultimate decision of what's included and what might go forward for consideration by the World Heritage Committee is made by the National Park Service and the committee itself. Uh, all we can do is suggest. That's uh, a good point to uh, definitely keep in mind. And, you know, as you talk about that, it's just a reminder to me that uh, no one site can tell the full story of the civil rights movement in America. Um, and so it is um, a neat way to go about it uh, to have this uh, multiple serial nomination effort. Exactly, yeah. And uh, just want to turn it over to you. Um, you know, what are the types of groups in our community um, that you feel would probably should be at the table uh, as we continue to engage with this effort? Well, uh, pretty much groups that are interested in the future of Farmville. So I would think immediately of things like any, uh, your, your Chamber of Commerce, your Convention and Visitors Bureau, the city itself, the planning department, um, the neighborhoods around the area. There is a historic African-American neighborhood to the Northwest um, that I think is very tied to the building. Um, I would, uh, if you have historical societies, um, of course, we've got other partners that are involved, the Virginia, um, State Historic Preservation Office, which is the Department of Natural Resources. They have been, um, they're very aware of the of the nomination. They're very, of course, they know Moton very well. They know the area well. I know they are um, interested in the, the Mary Branch Community Center. The group that's behind that, I believe it's owned by a nonprofit. We'd love to chat with them and just find out what they're thinking about. And if there's any way this process can help them with that center. Um, and, and you know who, what we can bring to bear, and we've talked a bit with city planning about um, the current zoning around Moton and what's going on with it. Because I know you have a brand new comprehensive uh, plan, which is great. So pretty much groups that are interested, uh, and of course, I mean your board and your alumni and all the folks that have direct connections to Moton. Those are the voices that I think will have the most power that, that that they want to see this part of their history, you know, elevated to that level and with these other uh, sites to be um, recognized for what, what happened, you know, what it did for the world. Excellent. I know uh, often members of our community uh, talk a lot about just wanting to make sure that Moton is protected. Um, as we move forward. And um, I think going through a process like this uh, helps to do that um, in a pretty profound way. Uh, you know, we are a national historic landmark, but, you know, what a powerful testimony to the 
site itself and to those that um, were on the front lines of this story to have the opportunity to um, be considered for World Heritage designation. Mm -hmm. The um, as you kind of bring together uh, these ten sites, uh, you know, we're starting the process of putting together uh, the site advisory committee. Um, have you seen any one particular area that has? It's kind of doing the community engagement piece uh, well. Anything that kind of sticks out to you? Well, I think the circuit, every site, I mean, every place is different how their community engagement works. Some, um, some are more formalized than others, um, and some are not. So, you know, 16th Street Baptist Church, their, their church and that community is very, very involved and what's happening downtown, and they are downtown. And there's been a lot going on with them with new uh, approach to zoning and things like that. So they're fairly well organized and they um, are very up to date on what's going on and how it affects their site. So this is sort of a natural next step for them. Other groups, you know, they're, we're having to, they're, they're gonna have to kind of work more from the beginning to develop that grassroots support. Uh, one of the things I, the site advisory board I'm hoping will work on is exactly that, is bringing, tasking each site with finding a leader at the local level who might be able to um, put the support together and be able to uh, speak for it. And then, um, you know, actually form a task group or a task force or, a, a, a you know, that just has representatives from this different group so that they're ready when they're called upon um, to, to offer the support that's needed. Well, and I'll throw out too that uh, because of the pandemic shutting everything down, we've kind of had a, uh, you know, we've a lot of people have had other more pressing matters to think about than <laughs> to get their site inscribed on the World Heritage List. Uh, we've, we, uh, Anne has been very good uh, reaching out to you, Cameron, and, and others. Uh, at the various properties and uh, maintaining contact. And uh, we're in the process now of uh, reinvigorating that whole network mm -hmm. and hope to again, resume site visits uh, uh, maybe by the end of the year uh, in order to build that local support, uh, which is crucial. Um, and earlier you were talking about uh, the commitment of the people in Farmville to protect Moton High, which is wonderful. Uh, think in terms of the uh, area around the school being protected as well, because you want to hang on to the context of that neighborhood. Uh, of course, there's been lots of change in the 50 years, uh, 60 years since things took place there. However, there's still elements of that historical past around and they need to be uh, protected. That's the idea of the buffer zone uh, around the school. Uh, and it's uh, key to setting the context and telling the story that you're already telling with your uh, exhibits and interpretation uh, and in the museum. Well, I will say to our community, to those that are listening, uh, we have uh, been grateful for so many that have come to the table uh, with the willingness to engage in this effort. Uh, and there are many more of you that we will continue to engage um, as we continue to move forward. And uh, I'm excited because I feel like it just seems like in the last couple of months, there's just been some good um, energy, you know, as we're moving along in terms of navigating the pandemic, uh, it's exciting to kind of get to the point where the site advisory committee is coming together. Um, you know, I'm saddened we won't get down to Atlanta for the symposium, but uh, it's just exciting that it's a lot of good energy and momentum um, as we uh, move forward. Yeah, I, you know, we regret exceedingly that there won't be a symposium and had had a wonderful lineup and event planned. 
Uh, and, you know, but that's uh, everybody's dealing with uh, how we've had to cut back uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, the hope is uh, to maybe put something on in 2022 uh, because we really want to see property owners and stakeholders, those representing uh, the sites we've been working with, come together because it facilitates networking. And uh, that began in 2017 at our symposia then. At that point, Moton was not, uh, it, was on the, it was on the screen, but we hadn't gotten very far in the effort yet. Uh, and uh, now we are and would really like to see uh, y'all come down to Atlanta and join with people from 16th Street and Central High School and Little Rock and uh, Memphis and uh, Atlanta, you know, just all over. And I'd like to say something quickly about the time frame, because uh, you saw our, our three phases with the last, the third phase in 2022. Those are those phases are um, defined basically by some the grants that the operational grants that we've been given. So Dr. Eskew and I, we're under the gun um, at the end of September 2022. We have to have a nomination done and handed in. That doesn't mean the process is over. That doesn't mean that we're finished. What it means is that we've got something fully developed to talk about. So in the case, um, so I, what I foresee happening is by that time in 2022, the management plans, which are already in pretty good shape, are, are pretty much ready, maybe some pieces to be finished, flushed out, and that this cooperative, this group of site advisory board cooperative managed council, that this group has sort of gelled and worked on some shared issues. And then they'll, everyone will be ready to move forward through the nominating process. So there will be a lot of reviews and revisions and questions, but we'll have the pieces in place ready to go. Excellent. And uh, as we kind of bring this conversation to a close, we'd just love to give you guys the opportunity to share any any parting thoughts, if you will. I'll, I'll throw this out. Um, the world needs to better understand uh, what the African-American community created in the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s and how that changed in the protest and promoted uh, democracy and freedom. Uh, and now's a good time for the world to be hearing that message all over again. So this is a great nomination and it is timely. Thank you. And what I'd like to do is thank the Farmville community and everyone who has worked with us so closely already. You all have been a joy to work with and it has been, um, I, I never worry about, about Moton and getting its materials together and the community supporting it. I, I feel like it's a really strong part of our nomination. It may not be the number one site that comes to people's heads like Central High School or Pettis Bridge, but it's tells such an important part that Glenn and I are really committed to getting, putting forth the case to get it to move forward in good company. Thank you. Well, I'm grateful to you both for your continued work and to uh, the scholars that are working alongside you at Georgia State. Uh, we are excited to continue to move forward and uh, we'll definitely be sharing with uh, you, the local community, uh, continued ways that you can support this effort, um, as well as uh, some broader advocacy as it relates uh, to UNESCO um, in the United States being a part of that. Uh, so this ends our Moton Mondays program for today. Again, this week we have on Wednesday at noon, Moten and in, Moten Live and Inside Look as we share about that upcoming virtual fundraising effort in April, as well as our CG Gordon Moss lecture with Dr. Dewana Wall on Thursday at 7 p.m. Both programs via our YouTube and Facebook platforms. So again, thank you both uh, for joining us today. And uh, this concludes our program. Thank, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you.